I graduated from nursing in 2004. When I graduated, the only logical place to get a job was a hospital. I had no idea there were many other places nurses could work since the only place we went to practice during our schooling was one of several hospitals in Montreal. Montreal has a lot of hospitals. When I started my first job, I cried a lot. I cried when someone died. I cried because a coworker got annoyed when I asked her a question. And I cried because I felt like I was the only one who wasn't handling this job. Or so I thought. I was a float team nurse and eventually I found a unit that seemed to always be short a nurse and I made some friends that weren't annoyed with my questions. So then I cried only half as much. Even at that, I would, I would wish I could be like one of the older nurses who seemed to always be able to do their job while remaining emotionally untouched. This was a mystery to me how I could become this. Well, our guest today worked in a different environment and saw different types of suffering, but during her time as a human rights lawyer would have given the same impression of being able to handle everything her job threw at her. Hi, and welcome to the Running Book Reviews podcast, where we review books written for runners, about runners, and by runners to help you decide if you'd like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running can help keep you motivated about your own running, or maybe inspire you to try something new. My name is Liz, and with my co-host Alan, we're going to talk with author Jen Scottney about her book, Running Through the Dark. Ultra runner Jen Scottney has achieved podium finishes in some of the UK's toughest races and had her sights set firmly on the Pennine Way. In Running Through the Dark, Jen talks about her ambitions, not just to run the 268-mile Pennine Way, but to take the record as the fastest woman to do so. But that didn't really all pan out the way she kind of thought it might. Nothing went according to plan. The Jen the world knew was a successful lawyer and running coach, all photo shoots and finish line smiles. But the truth was much darker. The real I feel like we should have some sort of piano music or something at this point, like da da da. <laughs> you the can real... add that in later. <laughs> <laughs> the real Jen Scottney, the one she hid from everyone, suffered with chronic fatigue, debilitating injuries, tragedy, grief, and at times had a will so beaten down by setbacks there just didn't seem to be any point in going on. Um, but there obviously was because we're talking to Jen today, so don't don't panic, guys. Um, a little bit about Jen. Jen Scottney boasts an impressive record as an ultra runner with podium finishes in the 108 mile Montaigne Winter Spine Challenger South and the 190 mile Northern Traverse. Those are for our North American listeners. Those are uh, massive, big uh, ultra trail runs in the UK. She is host of the Resilience Rising podcast, a running coach, writer, mountain leader, and yoga teacher. All of these have followed her career as a human rights lawyer. She has appeared in magazines, features for running for Runner's World, trail running, and women's running. She's been a guest host on the Wild Ginger Running YouTube channel and a guest on the Tough Girl podcast, among many others. She also crewed for John Kelly's successful Pennine Way Fastest Non Time, as well as for his Wayne Wrights Round in the Lake District. She grew up in the Peak District and now lives in the Scottish Mountains with her husband Marcus and Sherlock the Beagle. Running Through the Dark is her first book. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much. It's lovely to see you. Yeah, and your smiling face too. We've done our work. We've done our blurb at the front. Now it's your turn to to do do a bit. So maybe you could start by telling us why this book. How come you decided to write this book? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it starts with the Pennine Way. That bit um, was how it started, and. And like you said in the intro, I decided that I wanted to run the Pennine Way and I wanted to see if there were any women that had run it. At the time when I made that decision, there was a record by Mike Hartley for the men's record, but I couldn't. I I didn't know off the top of my head if there was any women that had run it. It seemed like, of course, there would be. At this point, there were women that had run it in the Montaigne Spine Race, so the full race of the Pennine Way. But I wanted to run it outside of the race. And also the race route misses out one of the peaks in the 
uh, Cheviots and, and has a slightly different route at some time. So I wanted to stay true to the Pennine Way route, which was actually a route that my parents had walked in the 1970s. So I started digging around, really, trying to find a women's record. And at first, this was just internet searches, and then there was nothing. But I started going through old fell running magazines. And, and in the end, I started talking to the men that had run it. So some of those were in my running club. They'd held various records and and also speaking to Mike Hartley and, and some of the other previous um, record holders. And I just got a sense that we were going to lose these records stories because um, some of these, well, there was already one of the runners that um, was in a care home and he died while I was preparing to write this book. So I thought, I don't want to lose the stories. And I was on a photo shoot with the publishers, Vertifet Publishing. They wanted some runners to appear in their Brecon Beacons fell, um, running guide book. And so I was chatting to John Barton from Vertebrate there, and I was telling him that I wanted to collect these stories of the Pennine Way. I still hadn't found any women that had run it, but I found that there were women that had helped the men, and the men seemed to have some good stories mm. about why they'd done the Pennine Way. And is, is that because uh, there are no women running? Surely there are. Are they, they just being women. shy and oh, oh, sort of demure and not sharing their story because that's bragging and that's what the guys do and they're all mm -hmm. going look at me and all the women are going oh we, we don't worry about that we just do our thing no I genuinely don't think there were women that had done I mean there, are, okay. there must be a fastest time of somebody yeah. of a woman that's walked it quickest mm -hmm. um, there was and, and there was definitely women that were running very long distances um so it wasn't that the distance was that I'm wondering if there was just a different focus of the women um they were certainly women doing well in races. Um, so one of the women that I spoke to was Helen Dimentas, who had won uh, the Dragon's Back race. So with her partner, um, Martin Stone, a running partner. And so there were women that were doing performing really well and, and were capable of running it. But it just hadn't it, ha it wasn't something that they'd done as a as a route. So that was really how the book came about was I wasn't supposed to be writing about me. Okay. I was collecting these stories. I started doing interviews of of the runners. But during this time, I thought, well, I'll just do a little note about my training because I thought it wouldn't be that long until I run the, my Pennine Way. Mm -hmm. I was just going to pop up at the end in the last chapter and everything would go really well. Maybe there'd yes. be a bit of drama about me. I mean, one of the stories that I had was, um, like Joss Naylor had lost his shoe in a bog or I think Mike Hartley had as well. And so it was something like that, maybe a little bit of drama. And then I'd just run in at the end and it would all be a lovely story. But <laughs> as you know, that didn't happen. <laughs> Unfortunately. But, yeah. So that was, it was never meant to come about as it, as it has done the book. Um, and I don't think I would have ever set off to write the book that turned out. So who who encouraged you to to write it anyway? Because it sounds like you, if it was up to you, you would have just abandoned it. Yeah. So what I did was I I got into a bit of a habit of writing, definitely not regularly, but I I certainly started writing. And actually, this was the first time that I maybe wrote a few running blogs because I was sponsored by Montaigne, and I think I'd written a few blogs for them. But otherwise, I didn't do any writing. The only writing that I did was quite dry, long legal drafting as as a lawyer, um, which wasn't that exciting. So I I just started writing and I found that I really I really got something from it. I'm not sure I was going to say enjoyed it, but it felt like it was helping me process things. So when things started going very wrong in terms of my preparation for running the Pennine Way, I I just found that it helped me to keep writing. And then a couple of years passed, I think at least, and the publishers came back to me and said, we've just had a bit of a swap around with staff. And now Kirsty Reed at Vertebra is your new editor, um, commissioning editor. And so I'd, I'd known Kirsty from outside of, you know, I'd, I'd seen her, I think when we were at UTMB, when I was crewing Marcus on that, we'd, we'd, a flight out with her just coincidentally so I, I did know her I sent her what I'd written so far which is probably about 20,000 words of it 
and it wasn't very coherent. There was a lot of, you know, unfinished sentences and paragraphs and things. Um, but I just said, look, I've been really ill and um, this is not the book that you you, you were expecting, but I've st- I've done, this is what I've done. And I fully expected her to just go, oh no, we don't want that. <laughs> um, but she, t- she was really encouraging and it was her that told me to keep writing. And my publishers were really, just really careful and they never gave me any deadlines and they never put any pressure on me because they knew what I was going through. But they were very encouraging on me keeping writing. So, yeah, that's what happened. And then I just got to a point where I just felt like I'd said everything that I needed to say and just hit send and sent it back to Kirsty. Um, but again, never expecting this to be a type of book that the publishers would publish because I just felt like it wasn't your classic story that I see in books. It wasn't this mm-hmm. wonderful success story. It was really messy. It was supposed to be about running, but it ended up being a lot about a lot of other things. And yeah, I think it just felt too messy for, for me. I think that if I'd known that it was going to be published and in people's hands all across the world, I probably would have censored myself about what I'd written and it just would have been a lot harder to be so truthful. Mm-hmm. So it's really the Jen Scottney private diaries and they've gone out <laughs> into the public word world. Is... It really feels like that. It's very odd. Actually, I, I feel like I feel like vertebrate. Yeah, they don't restrict themselves to nicely little package stories because like we also read uh, Ali Bailey's um, There Is No Wall. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it's the same kind of thing. It's it's kind of kind of messy, like her life is kind of rough around the edges you know even though um at the time you know she would have been classified as you know very successful in her previous job and everything so i feel like i don't know maybe they look for these like human type stories yeah. where it's not all rainbows and fairy tales it's not all u- unicorns and butterflies yeah and i think also i mean i know that i'm in like a mountaineering um, club and I'll go to these club huts so that I mean they're not really huts in like the alpine sense they're more just cheap accommodation in the UK but they tend mm-hmm. to have these old bookcases and generally yeah. there's no books by women there because mm-hmm. that just wasn't there's just a lot of books about men who go and conquer mountains and come back and tell us what it was like and I think that's I've had that maybe that old-fashioned view of that's what you need for a good story. So yeah, it's really refreshing the sort of books that Vertebra are supporting and the stories that are getting out because they're clearly connecting with people, um, these stories. And so, yeah, it's really positive. I think from that perspective, it's kind of, it's refreshing in some ways and and also adds to the authenticity of it. You know, life's an, life is not like a little parcel tied up with a nice, nice bow at the end. Yeah, and it's almost... It's almost like the anti story to yeah. social media and what we see all yes. the time on social media that just really highlights the highlights and yeah. makes everything seem like that lovely rainbows and everything going yeah, great. Here's a so. photo of me standing on top of the mountain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was my that was my Instagram yesterday. But <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're all entitled to a bit of it. Exactly. <laughs> Should have some. <laughs> I did I did put in one of my questions though. You know, did you originally write the the book is a diary because it, it has sort of chapters of years and yeah. seasons progressing. So it, it does have a little diary sort of. It does feel it. like that, but I, I probably know I didn't because I definitely, I didn't write it in chronological order. And I know the book isn't always in chronological order, yeah. but what I did was flip between all those times and topics. So I started, I, and also I suppose I worked backwards. So I started, um, talking about my illness and the stress but actually like one one of the kind of last chapters I wrote was about me being a lawyer like I hadn't really mentioned my job um but I just felt like there was I sort of needed to put in that groundwork of how I got to be in a quite a stressful job and then so a lot of the time I felt like I was working backwards and actually I sent in the draft to Kirsty the first manuscript which is a bit longer and then I had a lot of time to edit that and I went through to do an edit and there was, I'd, I'd like just, I'd repeated myself a bit, but also I hadn't finished paragraphs because I hadn't really been, I hadn't edited as I went along and I wasn't doing it from mm-hmm. one 
paragraph to the next. So it was, it was quite chaotic. I, well, it didn't feel chaotic. It kind of felt like, um, yeah, I just worked on what I felt like talking about at that time. It's pretty strange that you'd say you added a bit about the lawyer last because it, I don't know about you, Liz, but it came across to me like that was kind of a fundamental foundation of mm -hmm. like where you were. It sort of established you in the story, right? Sort of early, early on-ish. Do you take caffeine when you run? Lots of people do because it's in gels and stuff. And caffeine's legal and it's been proven to work. There's actual science that shows that it improves your uh, endurance running performance. And there's anecdotal data from when you have your coffee in the morning and you go for a workout versus when you forgot to have your coffee or you didn't have time and you went for a workout and it was terrible. And the trouble with coffee is there's a lot of liquid just to get your caffeine dose. Yeah, so then you have to stop for the bathroom mid-workout. Very impractical. Which is where Caffeine Bullet comes in. What's Caffeine Bullet, Liz? It's, uh, it, it's a caffeine supplement. It's wrapped up like in a candy. So, and it tastes like candy. And you can get 100 milligrams or 85 milligrams, which is about a cup of coffee, uh, but without the liquid. So we've tried the mint flavor and the chocolate orange flavor. Uh, they're both pretty yummy. If you want to try them for yourself, we do have a 20% off discount code. So go to the link in the show notes and um, you can check out what Caffeine Bullet is and get your 20% discount. It's pretty generous. It is pretty generous. And we'll we'll get a small benefit. So you're helping out the... Uh... Speaking of which, back to the podcast. I suppose the bits that I was doing as I was going along in a little bit more contemporaneously were the bits that were happening to me in front of me and also because I never thought that anybody else would read it I didn't really need to fill in the gaps like I knew mm -hmm. what job I did and yeah. <laughs> those sort of things um so yeah I didn't really feel when it was just for me and I just thought nobody's going to read this I didn't really need to explain the backstory at all and mm -hmm. actually one of the I didn't give it to many people as I was going through the editing process but I did give it to a writer called Matt Hill who just didn't know me or my background I'm friends with his wife and I just wanted him to see if there were any gaps because I was like I haven't written this for other people and I haven't written mm -hmm. this expecting other people to read it and want to know about my life I just wrote it for me so I don't need to write what people look like and I don't need to write what you know facts yeah. about people and because I know that so mm -hmm. yeah I definitely didn't write it for it, thinking that others would would need to know stuff about me so you um you were a human rights lawyer um which is very specific it's a it's a like it's a far cry from like my story when I graduated from nursing and it was like everybody all nurses just worked in a hospital that's what I thought but no it seems like like you you um, took law and you kind of, you know, were in a very specific niche. So how did you end up getting there? And like, have you ever thought of going to a different branch of law? Or was that just the the one that you felt the most strongly yeah, about? Some kind of calling? Yeah. Yeah, it did feel a little bit like a calling. I mean, when I was at doing my uh, postgraduate course, I did the bar course to be a barrister. And um, I did do lots of other areas of law and actually one of the highest ones and one of the, my teachers were trying to get me to go into was chancery which is a lot about um, kind of wills and trusts and people leaving large amounts of money to their family and oh wow it just didn't interest me like the arguing over money and who gets what mm -hmm. just did not interest me and I had undertaken some extra courses I just electives on my undergraduate degree about prisons and I was just very intrigued by kind of what happened in a prison but also how we treated prisoners and that rehabilitation and so I definitely had that that kind of calling when I was a bit younger at university and then when I had qualified after university yeah uh, I I went to London and I worked in that very specific area of law but yeah I always knew that I wanted to use my law degree and career just to help those less fortunate also when I was at university I worked in a law center and I did take on more range of cases so I did like immigration work and some other areas and 
then I started working in prisons and became very specialized. So I then specialized even further to young people and children in prisons. And by the time, at like the setting of for most of the book, I was probably one of the only lawyers outside London that specialized in children in prison. Oh, and, wow. care. and so I was getting cases from charities and and I'm really known for it and, and delivering training in it. I think the, what what it gave me was that because I was so specialized, I was dealing with really complex cases quite early on. So, for example, if I just got into kind of criminal defense, working up to murder takes decades of experience. Yeah. And what I found was that I was right in with the complex, with the high profile cases, with the really interesting stuff. But what that meant of specializing so early was that I just... I couldn't just sidestep into another area of law because I was so specific. So when I was looking at leaving law and it wasn't just because of my health, but it was also just the state of the funding and 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 that landscape of this area of law, because it's not very politically um, advantageous to be giving like legal aid money to prisoners. Um, so I was looking and yeah, my friends are like, oh, just go into corporate law or something where you're going to earn lots mm-hmm. of money. And I'm like, I have no idea. Um about any other area um yeah it was a really rewarding career um and I'm really proud of the cases that I did do it's actually kind of as an update um so since the books come out I mm-hmm. I don't I'm not a running coach anymore I just found that at the times when I couldn't run talking about running all day was like the last thing that I wanted to do yeah. it's kind of emotionally That's so fair. hard So I've done a few things. I've had the move up to Scotland, but I've started a part-time job and I'm working for a Scottish uh, member of parliament at the Scottish parliament. And I'm doing like researching cases for her, a green MP. It really aligns with my values. And although I'm not using kind of my legal knowledge, Mm -hmm. it definitely feels like I'm stepping back more into that world, which has been quite exciting. Yeah. Into a regulated type environment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what about running? I mean, it, it's probably a bit of a heartache story for you, but how did you get into running really long distances? Because when you were running, you were running really far. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I was, I was really active as a child and teenager. I used to run. I used to do like every sport at school. Football was my thing, and then I, when I was coincided with moving down to London I just came out of doing any sports and just got really unhealthy and it was when I was moved away from I mean actually in London I I remember running around the park so I was doing some running but it wasn't consistent and it wasn't really um, much to talk about but I did run around Rockwell Park and I actually started walking with uh, an ex-partner and we started going to the mountains on my weeks off, which weren't that many a year, maybe one or two. I then, yeah, that's really how I got into it, the, just from walking. And I moved to the countryside. I was still working really long hours, still at my desk, like 17 hours straight. And I just felt like I needed a change. And I got a dog because I'd always wanted a dog. And I thought, this is it. It's going to help me get fit. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it kind of worked. And what I found was I was just walk, just little flat bits I'd stop running and it just felt really good and this was at a time not long after my dad had died and my brother had died and it just it just helped it helped me feel really good about myself it helped me process things it helped me just yeah move on and just have a break from work and also when I was at work I was trying to hold up this kind of perfectionism of being this perfect lawyer and at home I was trying to be this perfect partner and I just found that when I was outside running I could just let all that go and and sometimes that was really messy I was just sat there crying and um, you know just trying to make sense of everything that had happened but and yeah and then I joined a, a local running club the Dark Peak Fell Runners and then suddenly, I suppose it was probably social media, uh, Twitter at the time. I don't think I was on Instagram then. And I suddenly saw that people could run long distances that I'd never. Oh, wow. like, my dad was a runner, fell runner, 
and he used to do some road marathons like maybe one a year and I kind of just didn't question that you could go longer than that because that seemed to um yeah finish my dad off for a few days he couldn't walk down the stairs um so that opened I know that feeling (laughs) I've never (laughs) run a road marathon and (laughs) then I yeah so I suppose that world opened up to me and I entered my first 50k I think yeah I think it was like 30 just over 30 miles in the peak district and I wasn't really training properly and it was just curiosity I just could not believe that but my body could do that um and then out of curiosity they just gradually got a little bit longer the races over a few years and that's how I found myself running some long distances and it was during that time that they took the cover photo for this book because this is like you happy in the mountains at the top of a mountain because <laughs> by that cause one there's nothing behind you but um <laughs> that is um on my first hundred miler and that's about 90 miles and yeah well it's the hundred oh, wow fine challenger I'm about 90 yeah. miles in you look and like you're I, still smiling yeah you're still oh, happy wow. happy still hard. happy to be there <laughs> <laughs> my feet were really hurting I made some bad choices with foot care in that race but we live and learn Mm -hmm. and also the photographer is John Bamba who's a friend so yes I mean sometimes I I can't say I was smiling the whole race but I definitely Mm. when John was pointing his camera saw the photographer pointing his camera at you (laughs) and you knew him so so you know makes you smile (laughs) makes you smile more so you came into you came into sort of ultra running from hiking from sort of mountain hiking and those kind of things in, in that way, rather than as a runner who got longer and longer and longer and then ended up going into the mountains. We hear in the book that you, you're sort of getting invited at one stage, you're getting invited overseas to go and give talks. So you're obviously at this point a famous, famous trail runner because you get invited overseas and people are paying for you to go to Greece to give talks. And you seem to sort of skim gaily over that in the book. I think it's just you being... Uh, modest or well I definitely don't introverted in the book yes I am introverted I mean I don't see myself in any way as the best trail runner and I was often I suppose doing well in races but I tended to do races where there wasn't a huge female field because they Mm. were pretty tough races maybe or, or seemed to be tough so you're actually hopeless at this but you've managed to fluke becoming famous is that what you're trying to say come on Jen I mean, I also feel like... Lay your trumpet a little bit. (laughs) I mean, the other thing was, is that, yes, I did get a lot of sponsorship, but when I... I met my husband, Marcus, and he was already had a name for himself as a trail mm-hmm. runner and had represented GB at 100K, 50K and things. So I feel like some of my like profile was kind of really on off. the back of him a little bit. Um, and I also... I my work at the time was very all that black and white legal drafting and the only colorful creative thing that I did was my Instagram and taking photos on my run it really was just a lit that was the only creative outlet that I had and I just feel like it wasn't necessarily because of just my race results because I didn't Mm. race loads I think it was just at that time and just the rise of trail running and ultra running and I had this colorful pictures I would out in beautiful countryside every day and i had a husband that was already famous so i think it was Mm. a mixture of a mixture of that i think if you write another book which is your biography you should call it jen scottney reluctant super athlete (laughs) or something like that (laughs) i'll ghost write it for you yeah yeah it'd be (laughs) so much easier if somebody else writes that (laughs) at one point you started to um just not be able to keep up with work and running anymore and one thing led to another and you discovered you had this mysterious disease called chronic fatigue it seems like it's got no real like treatment or cure and it's like it will last you know an arbitrary amount of time that you can't foresee and no one can tell you so maybe for the listeners you can tell us what's chronic fatigue how did you get the diagnosis? Because um, it could have been all kinds of other things. So um, I'm guessing it's it was some kind of process of elimination. But maybe you can you can tell us about that. 
Yeah, it is a process of elimination and it really just gets to the point where you've had this fatigue for, I think at the time it was six months. It's unexplained. We don't have anything in our tests. And so you've got chronic fatigue syndrome, which for me was really unhelpful because it stopped the doctors looking for any reason. And it also meant that they weren't they weren't allowing me to have any specialist treatment or referrals or anything. So it really just shut the door. I went through a series of my of doctors at my GP clinic. So the kind of day to day ones that we see. And at first there were issues that were able to be diagnosed. So the first thing for me, the first thing that I noticed was after I donated blood was feeling lightheaded and we went through, I was anemic and I could have iron tablets, but I started to feel better, but it got to the point months later where everything seemed normal in their test results. And yet I was still finding that by four in the afternoon, I couldn't kind of, I couldn't stand up and cook. I couldn't walk the dog. I couldn't work. And things were just getting worse in terms of my energy levels. And that's really, yeah, when I got my diagnosis. And I did see a really helpful doctor who was like, we need to find out why this fit 30 year old Mm -hmm. um, is struggling so much. And, and yet, then I mean it's just so crushing to hear all your test results are normal and like yeah. I was nothing but normal I was really really suffering and really scared because it just felt like my body was shutting down slowly and nobody could tell me what I was just getting told from the doctors to just stay positive and as if it was just in my mind so it was a really it was a really difficult time and like you say there was no treatment there's nothing. And this all took place initially before the pandemic. And so it was just, you've got ME slash chronic fatigue syndrome, that kind of, in terms of the what the diagnosis is the same. And yeah, it was just a very lonely place to be. And I had some success to start with, with Chinese medicine and seeing a Chinese doctor. She really, really helped me. And I was able to get back running and I'd have periods where I was working and running and life seemed to go well, but um, it would creep up again at some point. Mm -hmm. And I think when I was like one of the reasons for carrying on writing this book, like when it got to the point where it might actually get published um, by then we'd been through COVID and sadly there were so many people being diagnosed with long COVID or post-viral fatigue and mm. and the numbers of people that were suffering exploded and like suffering physically, but also suffering from there being no treatments and there being um, told. Um, it must know, be a vicious circle because you've got a physical manifestation and then it affects your mentality yeah. and your, yeah. your headspace. And of course that doesn't help you. No, and it's really hard to pick apart where the physical symptoms and the mental symptoms and everything mm. gets very entwined and messy. Um, and, and that's a huge part of my book, just dealing with that illness and the diagnosis and the lack of treatment and the lack of support and, and how difficult it was to be ill for that long around family and friends and, and nobody really knowing what to do or what to say or how to help me at all. Um, so yeah, yeah, it it was a a real tough part part of my life and actually i mean it's been quite a few years now and, and i'm really lucky in that i did recover but i don't think i'll have remembered how bad it was if i hadn't kept a record and and i wasn't writing every day like it wasn't a diary because there were days where i was just in bed just completely in the dark couldn't speak couldn't get up couldn't do anything um so it wasn't like i was sat there able to write but on the mm. times where I felt like I could write or I needed to write. Um, I kept I kept a kind of track of of what had happened and how I was feeling. And yeah, I think without that, I probably wouldn't have remembered just how bad it was. Wow. Is do you think it's any better now, like in terms of diagnosis or like have has anything changed because of all these people that have, you know, long COVID and those things that we've been hearing about? I mean, I think they're they're it, there's definitely positive. So when I was researching, I had one of my symptoms was just terrible insomnia. So I went for like seven years without a night's sleep. Oh and, my goodness. 
it was that's really, forever I know, I know and so it was in those generally at 4 a.m where I, I couldn't get up and try not to wake my husband I would be researching medical papers and just trying to kind of link together my symptoms and what was happening and there was just barely anything and but then what I noticed is suddenly there there is funding and that is research going into this so I feel like although that isn't the solution right now that's helping people that are currently suffering I hope that there has been massive gains in just in the time as well and getting funding and I think also that there has hopefully been a shift in that you know, a lot of the time when I was suffering with ME and chronic fatigue syndrome and people around me were, and, you know, I, I made connections in that, um, there wasn't sympathy from the doctors. It was almost like we were making it up. It was treated as a psychological thing. Like for me, the only thing that I was offered was antidepressants and told that I was depressed. And I think now I hope it is more recognized that, yes, there is something physically wrong with you rather than just mentally wrong with you, mm. which is is what we felt like at the time. So I really, really hope that there's something that helps people. Um, yeah. It sounded in the book like, um, apart from uh, acupuncture that you mentioned earlier, um, vitamin B12 injections seem to help you. And also COVID, va COVID vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Seem to help you. I had heard about that actually, um, like on the, on the news here. Um, when the vaccine came out, because apparently there was this like this group of people that had chronic fatigue before COVID ever happened, and they started to sort of mysteriously feel better. Oh wow! I didn't hear that actually. The one that I heard was that so initially, um, people with long COVID weren't given the COVID vaccine, and then yeah. I, I, there was a study that gave it to them and there was reports of people being of improving to, uh, and so there was this paper about it and I actually emailed some of the report writers the um, researchers and said this happened to me um so yeah I again I was I just said like I was really lucky and I also I get so many messages from people that want to know what happened to me and how I recovered because they're going through something similar mm -hmm. and I'm just really careful that I don't think it's going to work for everybody I know it's yeah. not going to work for everybody yeah. I was just really lucky so I hope that while this isn't a book that tells you how to get better from chronic fatigue what I hope it does is give you hope that people do recover despite what you're told from your doctors or what you read or about the statistics is that there are people like me who recover. And part of my recovery was I was trying anything. I was, you know, illegally buying B12. I was illegally buying sleeping tablets just to give me a bit of respite. And I was really surprised that the publishers let put all like kept all that in. I thought mm -hmm. all that would be edited out, but mm -hmm. I think it's quite brave of them to put all that in and just keep it as as I wrote it and what happened so yeah I was lucky um and I did just I did just try anything that I could in the times when I had enough energy to try stuff yeah um and all this time you still had hopes of running the Penine way um and and you would um yeah you would still try and train for it what why was the Penine way so important to you because this was years in the making. You you were training for, you know, thinking about it and planning it. And um, well, you did the, ra the race a few times, the, the, which was part of it, the challenge, which was not like yeah. a nine way. It was like only on a section of it. Um, but you dreamed of completing the, the whole thing. And um, I did. Kept that, kept that dream alive for a long time. I tried, so I tried. There's something <laughs> special about it. What is yeah. it? Oh, I mean, like I said, my parents had walked it and that seemed quite magical to me. And so it was always something and it was always a route that seemed to I, I seemed to be on quite a lot in terms of just when where I was living in the Peak District was very mm -hmm. near the start. I'd also spent time in Manchester and then we used to walk out. I used to go up to Hadrian's Wall to the kind of like latter bit and I, yeah, I've done that section a few times. Yeah, well, I used to go. There was a children's prison that's been changed now, but it was at Castington um, in the northeast where they had um, a lifer section. So they had children serving life sentences. So mm -hmm. I used to book 
visits to go and see clients and then spend a night camping on the uh, Hadrian's Wall section on the way back to Manchester. So I got to know bits of it. And I think I just love it. I love I love the bogs. I love how wild and remote <laughs> it seems. I love that. Like, you should my... watch. You should watch Liz's face as you're saying things like this. You know, <laughs> I love the bogs. I love the oh, wild I... hillsides. No. Camping in the dark. Um, like my <laughs> so, so camping in the dark is fine uh, for me. Running in the dark that sounds terrible. Like I don't know why people do that. Like they put themselves through this running through the dark thing, <laughs> and not not the title of your book, but I mean actually, like this is one of the reasons why I can't imagine doing a hundred miler because you know all you ever hear is about about like you know the sun setting and you're just trudging mm -hmm. through the woods and you start hallucinating and i'm like why <laughs> why would people want to want to put themselves through that uh but obviously i'm in the minority so <laughs> i just had a really busy job where people were trying to get hold of me all the time and being out in the dark in the evening was such a peaceful time for me when oh no i see okay wasn't okay that else yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was no reception so it was good yeah. for you <laughs> just keep running one of the things i should bring up at this point is that um in the book you describe going out and, and running little sections of of the penan way or some other race that you the traverse that you're and you, and you you run sections to get familiar with it and you call those reckies and yeah. uh about and i guess that's recce as in short for reconnoiter or reconnaissance reconnaissance um, yeah and and uh, I think it was a month ago we had someone on a podcast who, from the UK who was also talking about reckies and Liz mm -hmm. says, what are reckies? So for our North American audience, maybe <laughs> yes. you should exactly what you've talk described. about what reckies are. It's just going out, going over the ground to get familiar with it. So yeah, from reconnaissance, my little reconnaissance mission. And I used to go... I mean, there were so many reasons, partly just to get the navigation, just really familiar with the path so that when I was getting to parts of it, when I was tired, I wasn't really having to think, I wasn't having to get the map out. I knew where I was going to go. I also found them really useful for just getting used to the terrain so that you know that you're training on the right terrain, whether that's a mixture of mm -hmm. Pennine Way is really varied. So some anything from the kind of rocky mountains, like on that front cover of my book, it's got the lots of bogs, but a lot of yeah. the bogs because it's eroded. So a change from where my Quite parents a bit of land as well, I guess. Yeah, but Sorry. also those those flagstones so they put down stones to mark the path just so that it doesn't um become eroded so and then there's lanes there's fields there's all sorts muddy bits and so i really use those to just make sure that i was training and get my body used to the right thing i also found that if i were familiar with the route I, it really helped me visualize myself on it and i use visualization a lot so sometimes when i'm like lying in bed waiting to go to sleep i just start running the pennine way in my mind and just n noticing every twist every turn every style every gate every every little navigation thing and so that's another way that i i got to know it and also just my you know just visualizing myself finishing strong going through these beautiful um parts of it so, yeah, that's what my records are. But also when we're going back to like the draw of the Pennine Way, I mean, it was quite close to where I lived as well. It wasn't like I had to travel hundreds of miles to get to some of these places. The northern mm -hmm. bits were a little bit further. So I maybe would spend a weekend there or a few days there staying in the youth hostels, so cheap accommodation or staying with family and friends and, and getting to know those bits as well. But I think like when Liz was asking about why I still kept with this dream but I mean it's just it's just beautiful and I really I really love being in that landscape and um so yeah it was it was a pleasure to to go out and spend time in those in that landscape so did you basically run the entire Pennine Way but as like in pieces, Rekis, in yeah. pieces? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any bit that I haven't done. I think there might be one section from Alston to Hadrian's Wall, which isn't very long, and it's just known for being really wet and a bit flat and not the great greatest one, and I'm not sure whether I ever linked that up. But otherwise, yes, I've done the whole thing. And so 
often I was on my own. So what I was doing was running along it and then turning around and running back. So doing it out and back okay. and on it. So some of it I know really well. Yeah, it's the only way you get back to your car, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've had, we've had some of those. So um, you mentioned very, very briefly when we were talking the Dark Peak Fell Runners. This sounds sounds like some, I, I don't know, um, clan or sect or some sort of stealthy ninja tribe that uh, you've obviously <laughs> jo- joined. Who Probably, are, yeah. <laughs> don't sound fun and sunny, but who are the Dark Peak Fell Runners? <laughs> yeah. What's about them? Um, well... Our club vest is brown because of the fox with the okay. he- purple band <laughs> for the heather and a yellow band. So we're quite distinctive in terms of being seen at races. And for me, I was really shy. So it was quite, actually quite a big thing for me to join a running club. Okay. Um, my dad, I, he wasn't in Dark Peak Fell Runners, but he used to um, run with quite a few people that were and so I had heard of them and I remember my dad turning up for a run with them and he was just like, yeah, we just, they all had these torches and then just ran off and left me. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and so I so feel were they like. Based, based in the Peak District? Is that where yeah, the Peak comes from? That's in Derbyshire? Yeah. Yeah. So the Peak District is in Derbyshire, like right in the center of the country in the National Park where I was born bought up and mm-hmm. couldn't wait to move away from when I was a teenager because it was the most boring place for a teenager and then spent my life coming back to it. And so it's from the Peak District. And the Peak District, one thing that I love about it, it's kind of split up geographically in that in the south, it's got this white limestone underneath mm-hmm. it. So the limestone gives us all these beautiful little dales and full of wild flowers and really green and lush and then to the north of the peak district is the dark peak where it's the grit stone for the climbers and it's the heather and the um moorland and the bogs and the peat it's kind of rivendell to begin with and then mordor (laughs) Uh, afterwards, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan. <laughs> and I lived right in the middle of Rivendell okay. and Mordor. <laughs> so out the back door, I had all the green, and out the front door, I had all the gritstone edges and the moorland. Okay. And so that's known as the Dark Peak and then the White Peak. Um, so it's based on the rocks underneath. And, yeah, for me, Dark Peak Fell Runners, they're... And you clearly loved it because I can see it on your face while you're describing it. <laughs> yeah. The Liz yeah, nodding I mean... there. Um, you can see you, you light up when you talk about it. I mean, it really <laughs> does mean something to you. Do you yeah. still um do you do you still keep in touch with the runners? Like, yeah, have you yeah. kept some of the friends? I mean, I know it's you know it's probably a bit of a sore spot, but no, I have kept some of the friends. I've kept in the club actually. Um, and last week it was the OM, the original Mountain Marathon. I'm not sure if you've done that one, Alan. No. Um, I know but. That one. This is a two-day navigation race and you have to carry, you do it in pairs and you have to carry all, all your food, yeah. tent, everything that yeah. you need to be self-sufficient. Liz and, and I have do- come across mountain marathons in some of our previous books. Liz also doesn't understand why people do that either. <laughs> You've got, there's no route. You just get a map on the yeah. start line and have to <laughs> either visit, follow, a, follow all, you just have to find these controls that are hidden all over. And actually last week it was, right on our doorstep in the Scottish Highlands. They went to Glen Artney. And so we had a house full of dark peak runners that had come to do oh, the wonderful. race that stayed with us before. So that was really nice. And I say that unlike some of the running clubs that I hear about, dark peak fell runners aren't particularly into the organised nights. And they're a little mm-hmm. bit quirky. They have their own little routes. And the award ceremonies are some of the best nights <laughs> And yeah, they're they're very much a kind of a, a certain people that like running in the dark on the moors. Maybe not the club for you to join. <laughs> I guess running in the dark with someone is much better than running in the dark by yourself, um, because you know in in Canada, like now, six p.m. it's pitch black, so yeah. you we're basically running in the dark until the spring. But um, but then if they will leave you behind because your dad got left behind, <laughs> I'm, then I'm not really sure about that. I think maybe I'm just going to stay I here. I think that, that 
<laughs> yeah, you're encouraged to be self-sufficient in dark peat farmlands, I say. But I okay. prefer, I much prefer running on my own in the dark. I love just having that narrow beam of light, that focus from your head torch. And I love just it, yeah, like watching the stars and the moon and listening to the animals and the owls hooting. And so... Yeah, I know. I'm trying to think. I don't often, I didn't often run with people in the dark. I much prefer going out on my own. I, I really love running in the dark, but I prefer to have someone to talk to, like, are you still there? Yeah. Um, and also because, like, talking to somebody means you're scaring the bears away if there are any. Well, I would say that, yeah, we don't quite have that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. I heard that you don't really have bears to worry about in the uh, UK. No, we don't really have to worry about wildlife. No. I've, done some, I've done some running with a couple of friends in Australia through the night, um, through the bush. And there was enough moon that we all switched our headlights off. Mm. And your your eyes open up and you get a much you get a much wider view. You're not just tunnel visioned. Um, and that's really is quite wonderful. Yeah. And I've yeah. actually had that since not been running in Scotland, but I went out on the Tarmacan Ridge, which is Tarmacan Mountain, and then a little kind of knife edge ridge ish. And it was such a beautiful sunset. And then I came off and I just had a few miles back to the car, and it was such a bright full moon that I could switch off my head torch. And it is just, it really feels a privilege to be out at that time. And just as the world seems to be going to bed and calming down and resting and just to be out, for me, it's just really peaceful. So, you know, I understand completely that feeling, except I do it at like 5 a.m., not not 11 p.m. So, <laughs> but no, I get it. Now now you're speaking my language, but uh, I just, um, yeah, it's, I, I just do it in a at a slightly different time of the night. <laughs> I mean, I was always a morning runner and often would set off in the head with my head torch and then run into sunrise and I definitely would prefer that if I had mm -hmm. the choice. Um okay. so I'm with you I'm with you on that. But there was definitely I quite like running through a night as well. Okay. Do you do you still have you talked about um you know giving up coaching because you didn't want to coach and be on the sidelines if you couldn't run and so do you do you now do you still have any running related ambitions or does your focus lie elsewhere? It's really hard without giving away the whole book, isn't it? Um, I mean, I was left with a choice of needing surgery and the surgeon said to me, I won't do this if I think you're going to run again. And I take mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I'm not running at the moment isn't because of that is well, it's because it's just too painful. And for me, a lot of the book was about, well, that fallout of what it's like when you've had such a focus in your life of running. So at the point where mm -hmm. it's not only just a hobby, but I've also made a career out of it and my friends and everything in my life was all about running. And then what happens when yeah. you can't run and, mm -hmm. and what that's mm -hmm. like. And I think for me, it's been such a long process and, and messy, as you can tell from the book. But then I think I'm, I feel like I've come on because it was probably like two years since I finished writing the book. So still been yeah. a lot of work and a lot of processing. And for me, it's been a much healthier to find a focus away from running rather than trying to cling on and grasp on to this idea that I need to run in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's not saying that I'm really happy with that. I would still, if you, if I could physically, I would run tomorrow because I really love it. But at the moment I, um, I've definitely built a life away from running. I still, like I mentioned about people, all these house full of runners last weekend and my husband still runs. So I still go to races to support and crew him. And I still have contact with runners. Your connections. Yeah. yeah, but I definitely nowhere near to the same extent. And I don't really put myself into going to runs, helping out at races that I might have done before. I've unfollowed a lot of social media accounts that are all about running and that's just how wonderful their running are. So I'm a little bit, well, a lot more kind of, I suppose, um, aware of, of Sounds what like I we're want. lucky that we got you on the Running Book Reviews podcast. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, you would have run followed us, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is really odd in that I suppose one of the things that I talk about in the book is like, 
I suppose going back to that fallout of when you can't run and um, mm. sponsors, I had sponsorship and that was dropped because I was injured and couldn't run. Yeah. And then it was like, and also, like you say, I was invited out to do talks. I was, I was on podcasts and suddenly it all goes, all the invitations go. So it's been a bit weird to then have that come back with the book coming yeah. out. And I suppose it's not that I need, you know, I, I've worked through so much of, of my identity and building a life outside of that being a runner and having all that external validation for running. And it's weird that it's come back in, but it is nice to connect. And it's nice to tell this story because I know from the messages that I've received after people have read the book, that it's really helped some people feel less alone and really, it's really been positive for them. So I guess that kind of spurs mm. me on to get back into the talking and and mm-hmm. popping out of my hibernation going, I'm still here. <laughs> I think um, I think all of that exploration is, um, I think it's something that a lot of people deal with, but maybe for different reasons, because on social media, um, and I can't remember what platform it was on, but recently, I, and I can't even remember the original post, but there was a comment and the comment said, after I had cancer, I felt abandoned by the running community or like I felt like put put aside by the running community because she used to be fast and she no longer is. But it sounds like she was running from the comment, but she wasn't running as fast anymore. And she felt like if she felt like she had been abandoned by by the community because of that. I think like people that have to find their way to the other end of this, like what does running mean now because it's so different. Um, I think there's probably a lot of those. And Mm -hmm. so you're probably helping a lot of people that are in the running community that, that, you know. So yeah, I think you belong. Just in our club, we um, we have people that, you know, we're running and then for different reasons, they can't run anymore. Whether it's, uh, you know, arthritis in the knees or you know, arthritis in the hips or, you know, and I think all of us, whether we admit it or not to ourselves right now, are going to have to deal with a a slowdown, some kind of degrading in our running. And I guess the question is just how, how do you stay connected with the community while not being able to partake in the activity? Yeah. Yeah. If you have some burning why, and then you don't have that why anymore, how do you get Mm -hmm. the next step? One of the people, another Matt, that I gave it to to just get some feedback on another writer, and they there were only two two writers that I asked, and he asked me why I hadn't put in the conclusion about the running community and how great they were and all this support and that it didn't matter that I wasn't running because the community was so great, and I just I was really surprised because I was like that is not my experience so many people people that were friends that would you know often comment on my things ask me questions like people that come to my house come to run with me I've never heard from them again and and it's probably two-way like it got to the point where I did have this big unfollow everybody yeah maybe you didn't want to uh, have contact with them well no I mean I like I suppose the the most supportive people were asking me for a walk asking me to do to spend time with them, go for a coffee, do something mm-hmm. where they could see me that didn't involve running. But that was such a small, like I'm talking of a handful of people. Mm-hmm. And I think for me now, I I mean, we're wired to be in communities, aren't we? That's how we've survived for so long. Yeah. And so tribes, tribes, we want to belong. And I think yeah. that running is such a strong tribe. It's so, so many people and somewhere where I felt so much I I did feel that belonging and real community but what I think my discovery is is that there's other things outside of running and I've reconnected with friends that have never run a step in their life and they're perfectly fulfilled and happy and just gives me some perspective that it's not all about running and also I do feel that taking that step back from ultra marathons you can see how it really, well, not not even masks, but actually can celebrate some really unhealthy behaviours, some really disordered eating, some exercise addictions, and really glamorises that. And mm. I I don't think that if I could 
even if you could wave a magic wand and I could go back to running, I'm not sure I would be doing those long distances anymore just because of the trauma and the stress on the body. And for me, I just took my health for granted until the minute it's not there. And suddenly I couldn't get out of bed. I literally, I was lying pinned to the bed and I could not move a muscle and there was just nothing that I could do. I was willing myself to just get out of bed and walk to the bathroom or walk to the kitchen or whatever. And I couldn't do that. And I think that now coming back to it with knowing what it's like to lose my health, I'm not sure I could push myself to those sleep deprived depths that I used to because I just worry personally about recovery and the damage that it's doing and I think I just yeah have so much respect so for me it's not about staying connected with the running community I don't need to I just I'm quite happy just having friends that run but Mm -hmm. I don't run with them so I need friends that are happy to do other things and I've moved away and moved up to Scotland I've joined our local mountain rescue team that's been a really good focus I've started a new career working for the politician I go out paddle boarding and just have a more rounded life I guess I think I mean if you'd have asked me when I was getting those results and and seemingly doing well if I had a balanced life and had interests outside of running I'd have gone yes of course I do Mm -hmm. and I things that I could name but I don't you clearly from what happened when I couldn't run anymore it wasn't it wasn't as balanced as I thought it was and my identity wasn't quite as built on strong foundations as I thought it was I'd got so much from running but it's really fragile if running can be taken away from you overnight yeah I think what you need to do is you need to start a new office called Jen Scottney's Post Runners Aftercare which is (laughs) Come with me. Just, yeah. just a new, actually, a new business actually, opportunity where we I contact think... you and say, oh, I'm not running anymore. What should I do? And you say, Come with me. I have a course for you. Let's go for a You know walk. what? The, what I find myself saying so much to runners that are taking things way too seriously is, yeah. It's just running in a circle. It's not, <laughs> not really that important. <laughs> I think, in a way, you you maybe have because um you have your own podcast now do you want to tell us about that yeah so my podcast is resilience rising podcast and i call it a podcast that gets curious about resilience so i it's really odd when i hear people describe this book about being a story of resilience because At that point where the book finishes, I really felt like I was not resilient. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had spent far too many hours crying on the sofa, feeling really sorry for myself, feeling really sorry that I couldn't just go out and run and do all these things that I wanted to. And very much woe is me. And I kind of got to the point where I was really annoying myself with it. And I wanted to find out how to be resilient. That's really what I wanted to do. And I thought a podcast was a perfect way of having an excuse to ask people that knew more about this than me. So I started interviewing people that I thought could tell me something about resilience, which is kind of everybody. I feel like everybody has a story about resilience. And that's how the podcast came about. And I think I think what's changed from when I set out, I think what I was looking for was some sort of magic formula so that I would never be sobbing on the sofa again and that I would, everything would just kind of fly off me like I was wearing the shield of Mm -hmm. nothing bad's going to happen because I thought that's what resilience meant. But actually what I found is that the sobbing on the sofa is all part of resilience. And I do feel like Part of it has been uncovering my resilience. I actually, I was doing my best and I was just trying to survive and my body was trying to survive and keep me alive. And I wasn't as bad as I thought I was. But then I also have had so many discussions where I really get a new perspective on resilience and things that help. So for example, before when I might go feel those really low moments or the, 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 I'm going to start crying on the sofa, um, I would be berating myself that I wasn't resilient. And now I'm like, okay, first of all, like, have I slept? Have I eaten well? And have I gone outside for a walk? And 
and there are ways that we can really help ourselves to be more resilient um so it's been it's been really it's such a great focus and and really educational for me and again like I've got some really lovely messages about people and in terms of who I get on the podcast I talk to some experts I managed to find people with PhDs in resilience um but psychology That's amazing I know Psy- oh. psychologists coaches and yeah so people that where it's like professionally that's what what they're working with but I also try and get a kind of diverse range of people that have just been through tough times so that's what I want to know how how have we got through tough times so there's people I spoke to a woman whose husband had been murdered I spoke to a woman who's had child bereavement people that have been through alcoholism Mm -hmm. and just um, a wide range so today I was recording an episode which isn't out yet but that's with a writer I think that writers are really resilient in terms of all the rejections and things and she's got a podcast about called the um, right, uh, Rejected Writers Club. <laughs> um, but she also has PTSD and was explaining like really what helps her. So, yeah, that's been, again, another focus outside running. Life does exist without running. And there's some really it's just such a great way to chat to people. As I'm chatting to you now, we yeah. would not have connected without podcasts. And I just feel like it's so it's such a privilege to just be able to contact somebody and say, can I have a conversation with you? And can I record mm-hmm. it? Yeah. And, and it's just brilliant. There are people all over the world that I've spoken to. And there are people all over the world that probably listen. And, you know, this wasn't kind of a thing. And it, it's almost like you're taking the, uh, the, C- the CBC, you know, special hour broadcast channel but like now you make it accessible to everybody. Everyone can make one. And that means, you know, everyone can be involved and everyone can listen. And yeah, it's uh, podcasts are are pretty special that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so since you're in this resilience space and we're running book reviews, um, yeah, have you read any books about resilience? And do you have like one that you would... I don't know, that maybe spoke to you the most or that you'd recommend? Oh, you know, (laughs) I read a lot of books about resilience, but I tend to read them just before I'm about to interview the writer of them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I have this very lawyer thing. So then maybe maybe the most recent one. Just tell us the most (laughs) recent one you read. (laughs) Because you've probably forgotten all of the others. I've forgotten all of the others. (laughs) I, I mean, I spoke to somebody who'd written a book, so um, Suk, who'd written a book about, uh, called The Resilience Handbook. Oh, wow. I'd, okay. Oh, I'd love to have, yeah, if, uh, Do Hard Things. I've definitely read that one. And that one was really interesting as well. Um, I'm looking forward to his new one coming out, Steve Magnus. Yes. Um, but yes, I, so I spoke to somebody who'd written The Resilience Handbook. I think what I've been su- which is really good. What I've been surprised about when I start writing a reading about resilience and interviewing these guests is something that comes up time and time again is mindfulness, is meditation, is stillness. And for me, these weren't words that I would have used in terms of resilience. I had this idea that a resilient person was somebody who was really stoic, that just pushed on which is probably like me as a lawyer that, uh, and like you described in your job that it doesn't matter what's happening on the inside or in my private life. I'm showing up for the people that I'm working with, whether that's my patients or in my case, my clients. And it was this toughness, this kind of stoic resilience that was pushing through and it's just not sustainable. You know, I really burn out and I attribute a lot of my health problems to that. So to find that even in these books about resilience, that there is this time for just, for just pausing, for doing nothing, (laughs) for really resting well, these are, it's just been really, really enlightening to see that as part of resilience. And it's not like, you know, I'm a yoga teacher and I've had a meditation practice for a long time. So these are not things that were particularly new to me, but they were, it was a new way of looking at them in terms of, yeah, how they help us get through tough times. I think increasingly what we see with with resilience uh, and those kinds of uh, aspects is if you try to be tough, 
eventually you break. And if you try to be still or if you try to be supple, if you try to bend rather than be hard, you have whatever the definition of that is in your situation, you have a chance to to endure. Mm. And that's kind of what we've learned in our running book reviews aspects when, you know, toughness and mental toughness and um, doing hard things and we can do hard things and all of that comes up. I think Liz and I are big uh, advocates of of uh, an approach which is not very macho and is more not facing up and, you know, fighting the fight and refusing to back down, but more, more zen. Fight the fights that are more um, worth fighting or fight Choose the fights fight, that are profitable. Bend, yeah. bend with the wind, you know, st stay still if you can't make ground retreat and come back on another day when you feel stronger or, you know, those, those kind of things. And I'll be looking up your, uh, your podcast, um, and seeing what it has to offer me in my, uh, in my armory of, of being better prepared to run as well. Yeah. And I have had quite a lot of adventure and at endurance and not loads of runners on. So what I found was that, in as you know from my book I've gone through some pretty tough days and I don't put I don't really put my running in any of those like for me running was fun mm. and it was a privilege and it was something that I'd chosen and what I've yeah. tried to focus more on the podcast is how we get through the tough times that we haven't chosen and mm. Which is much more tough because which is much mm. tougher because you haven't chosen it and you we can't haven't chosen them we it. haven't Pay hundreds of pounds. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think that if I, I have had people contact me to ask if they can be on the podcast because they want to talk about their hundred mile race and how they were at the back of the pack or it was really tough. And I'm like, well, it's great, but it's not really what the focus of the podcast is because mm. I kind of chose to be there. And if you pull out of a race, nothing really bad happens. Like, yes, you might, yeah. your ego might take a bashing, but no, there's nothing really serious. And so at first I was very much, it's all pointless and running meant nothing. And then maybe I've kind of lessened that attitude in that running can be a way that we can practice resilience by yeah. putting ourselves in something I mean, more a bit I agree with that. It's a way of training yourself to be more resilient for life. Yeah, Maybe. but I mean, look at look at how I I still don't think it particularly, you know, it still didn't help me that much when oh. things went really wrong, and yeah. so I yeah. How much more me, wrong would it have been if you hadn't been a runner? You'll never know. And um, then there wouldn't have been a problem if I couldn't run. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's there, okay. that's <laughs> true. That's true. But mm. but then yeah. there was like the writer that I was interviewing today, and she was talking about that need to write and how what a massive thing it would be if she couldn't write. And um, mm -hmm. so I guess it depends on on what it is that you brings you joy and and you really want to focus on in life. But yeah, I do. I, I did have John Kelly on the podcast. I did ask him to come on. And I think he more described his um, resilience as more of a stubbornness in his running. But mm -hmm. what I found really healthy when I was chatting to John was about his why and about how it comes from this, this curiosity of, can I do that? And he's very happy with failure. He kind of knows mm -hmm. that most of his things, well, achievements, he's had to fail a couple of times at least before he actually gets the result that he wants. And so I think there is a way that we can approach these long races and running with a really healthy mindset, the sort of mindset that comes up in the resilience chat that I have, where it isn't just about pushing through and it isn't about being scared of failure and stepping away if it's not your day. And, and also prioritizing your health. Um, we can't kind of sit here and say that it's really healthy to run these really long distances because it's not the science, the science doesn't back that it does, up doesn't seem like it i mean you know people are vomiting on the trails uh you know you're having hallucinations <laughs> well it's not healthy to drink beer either but people do it oh um, that's true i guess well i, I think I the know. thing that gets me is often people don't look very happy so <laughs> <laughs> actually no they, but they look really happy at the end and i think it's like a bit like childbirth where like when they get to the finish line they forget all about the pain they endured to get there 
<laughs> which condemns yeah, them to repeat the exercise. I don't really sign up to the suffering. Like it's it's fun. It's fun to be out there. And yeah, maybe I had times where I was like, oh, I'm ready for this to be over, or I just really want to get to the end and have a cup of tea and a sit down. But I don't remember any deep, dark, low moments um on the trail. It was generally quite fun. Um, we should probably ask you from a book point of view, do you want to direct listeners anywhere in particular to get a copy of the book? So the book is Running Through the Dark with Jen Scottney and it's out with Vertebrate Publishing. And I definitely direct listeners there because there's a massive range of amazing books on their website that yeah. I'm a privilege to be part of. And it's a publishers that I regularly order books from. So um, I've just had a mountain biking book delivered and I'm looking forward to Paul Besley's book um, coming out. So, yes, so that's Vertebrate Publishing, but it's available from wherever you normally get your books. And is there an audio book? Yes, I spent two days in a windowless room recording <laughs> the audio myself. Oh, um, wow. It was quite intense because I had finished the book and then like two years ago probably two and a half now and was given a long time for an edit I just did that in a week and then I didn't touch the book and they didn't really touch the book for a while so it kind of floated along and then suddenly everything happened and I suddenly it was all signed off and I had to go and read it and it was really tough like I haven't revisited some of these memories <laughs> that yes. I write about um, for a long time other than a couple of edits um, and that's different to reading it out loud. So mm -hmm. me and the sound engineer had to keep taking lots of breaks. Um, but yes, there what, is an what, idea, but... emotional pauses or emo emo yeah, mm. yeah. Pull and yourself together breaks. I don't I know. I've, I'm changed with this yeah. resilience thing that I don't uh, know. Okay. <laughs> I just feel <laughs> it. <laughs> mm. But yeah, it, but then there was like, we need to finish this now. Um, yeah. yeah, it was, it was tough. And I think the toughest bit was just how hard I was on myself. Yes. How much pressure I put on myself. And I just really wanted to reach into that kind of lost, scared, lonely girl and say, mm -hmm. you're going to be okay. You're going to, you're going to yeah. get through this. I gave you several um, metaphorical hugs during my read through. Thanks. I mean, I got messages from people saying I read it in one go on the first day. I got it. I'm like, really? Because I couldn't do that. So yeah. well done to you. I mean, that, I could see that as possible. You start reading. Well, although the person probably didn't go to sleep at any well, Liz and I, hour. Liz and I actually, just full disclosure, Liz and I both read the book in two bus rides. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, were, we were going to a club, club run and uh, it was uh, like a seven hour ride. Uh, there and then we did a, a trail run and then it was a seven hour ride back uh, not on the same two day. days later <laughs> uh, we, so we like read it we read it from start to finish the, whole of the country in that time yeah 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 there's uh that's, there's a, that's just an a, ultra bus a short ride. distance across canada <laughs> a small distance across canada um, different size oh, country thank you well it sounds like yeah you're yeah. in that endurance camp that... and if people want to um follow you check what you're doing um, apart from looking for a Resilience Rising podcast, yep. so um, how a... can they follow Jen? So Jen Scottney on Instagram is probably the best way. And um, you'll see pictures of me in the Scottish Highlands now. And you still have your dog? Yes, he was shaking and making a bit of a noise when I was talking. So okay. sorry about that. But I don't think we, we didn't can... hear a thing. No, I had a baby I, crying in the background of mine, so I don't think you heard that either. <laughs> well, when we did our Run It Wild Ginger podcast and YouTube yeah. channel, we could the dog would come in front of us in the, on the sofa where we did it and just snore, and we could see the mic just going up <laughs> with snoring. So, oh my goodness, that's so funny! Became quite infamous on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> I kept having to say to guests, "I'm really sorry, that's not us, that's the dog." <laughs> But yeah, Sherlock's still here. He'll be 13 in a Christ. couple wow. of weeks. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, incredibly, uh, Jen, for coming on and sharing with us. And uh, you're clearly a professional podcaster because you're going to make my editing job really easy for this episode. So thank, thank you, you also so for much. that. Thank you. It was lovely to speak to you both. And thank you for all your kind words about the book and reading it. We'll just give our summary views. 
James Courtney's Running Through the Dark. So th there are some parallels with our recent book that we that we did quite recently called Running from Tragedy with um, Michael Salisbury. Big, big difficulties that are raw and a bit uncomfortable with running as an essential component, working through it. It's clear from reading the book that the impression you can get of some people can be far from the reality that, you know, what's actually going on. And um, I think to some extent, the book's encouraging for anybody who's struggling with some aspects of their life or feeling that, you know, they're providing some sort of facade, some sort of internet uh, highlight reel of their life when in fact their life's nothing like that. Um, to some extent, everybody's going through that. Jen deals with some serious issues in terms of in particular chronic fatigue, which you know, is, is highly impressing on her life, but early on with bereavement as well, which seems to kick the whole thing off. We didn't really go into that much, but uh I mean, that's for another day. And also the, the, we touch on uh, grief associated with childlessness, childlessness, which uh, Jen also touches on, which we didn't cover in the discussion. Hey, you have to leave something for the readers to read, Alan. Yeah, I've given the game away now. Jen's clearly a great ultra runner despite dealing with all these issues. And despite being this superstar, as I described it, superstar ultra runner, she does seem in the book to be quite introverted and she's already confessed to that. With a certain amount of imposter syndrome, I think. Like, oh, it's just little old me. Oh, I seem to have won. Oh, I seem to have come third in this huge race. How did that happen? Um, so there's this sort of aspects of that. Um, what I would say is it's very authentic. In summary, I would say it's a great read that comes straight from our heart. So it's a fun read from that point of view. And we managed it in two sittings. I guess I'll I'll echo a little bit of Alan's uh, summary, but it. This is a story of struggle, but it's also a story of never giving up hope because during all of her struggles with chronic fatigue, you know, there was always a glimmer of hope that would kind of float to the surface and, and Jen would try and research, you know, research the heck out of what she could try next. So it's definitely, there's a lot of struggle, but there's, uh, there's also not giving up, um, it's also about finding a way to accept where you're at right now and learning to love yourself anyway. That was a big component of of the story. Jen had to kind of learn that along the way. As I was reading this one, it reminded me of my uh, sub three hour marathon goal. Although I don't have chronic fatigue or any other reason to believe I won't eventually achieve it. I've been trying for over a decade since the seed was initially planted. So I think it was planted in like 2010 uh when my coach at the time you know i had just run about 3 315 and he said okay next step is is three hours and although i've gotten closer i'm still kind of far from my goal because i uh, i've only run my best is 304 four or five minutes is seems to be uh hard to get i kept reading to get the happy ending thinking that it would mean that jen achieves her penine way record but it ended a little differently, as we've kind of discussed. I found Jen's analysis of herself throughout the book interesting, and her sharing of some negative thoughts just showed that she's human. Um, so she did share that at one point she cried because the women's record was broken by another woman when she wanted to be the one to do it. And it just showed that the sort of like moment of frustration. And she wasn't, you know, she wasn't angry at this other woman. She was just frustrated at where she was at the time. So I guess I would recommend this one to anyone going through a hard time who needs a reminder that they're not alone. So get out there and get your copy of Jen Scottney's Running Through the Dark. And also, also the cover is really great. It's actually very, very um, on, on theme, I guess, because, you know, the title is Running Through the Dark. And other than, you know, the, the, her name being in pink, it's uh, like a black and white, mostly mostly kind of a dark photo in the background. It's really nice. There are some cool, some cool color photos on the back as well. Of mm -hmm. Various activities, including either at the start or the end of the Pennine Way. I can't tell whether you're at the beginning or the end of the Pennine Way on that photograph. But... So a big thank you for listening to another episode of Running Book Reviews. Thank you to publisher Vertebrate, 
um, who, who provide us with a whole bunch of different uh, books from time to time, but for providing us with review copies of this book. A big thank you to Jen for spending time with us today. If you'd like to leave us some feedback of how we can improve the podcast or want to suggest a book that you'd like us to review in a future episode, please leave us a comment on social media. On Facebook and Instagram, we are running book reviews. And on Twitter, brackets X, close brackets, we are reviews underscore running. Please feel free to follow us on social media to find out about new episodes when they're released, or you can just subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. You might also, if you like, try to subscribe to uh, Resilience Rising by Jen Scott. Hey, give her a plug for her efforts for us today. If you've been listening to us for a while and are wondering how you can help us out, there are a few ways. If you're enjoying the podcast, spread the word. Tell your friends about us or share a link to your favorite episode with a running partner or any partner for that matter. Leave us a review on Apple Podcast if this is how you listen to the podcast or you can rate us on Spotify out of five stars. Liz is still waiting for the one-star review that she's been trying to get for some time. Please do not leave us a one-star rating. We're also on a platform called Buy Me A Coffee. Um, you can go to buymeacoffee.com and search creators and you'll find running book reviews where you'll find a whole bunch of outtakes, photographs, um, little snippets, us appearing on other podcasts, etc., etc. And if you want, you can buy us a coffee, but you don't, don't feel you have to. That's all for running book reviews. Bye for now. Bye.